Hi everyone, I'm Jean-Marc Voyantes. I'm a neurosurgeon specializing in both brain and spinal surgery. And today what I'm going to talk to you about is anterior cervical discectomy and fusion surgery. I'll go over a little bit of the spinal anatomy of the cervical spine. We'll discuss the technique of anterior cervical discectomy and surgery. I'll review the reasons for which we recommend surgery. We'll go over the expected recovery and I'll also spend some time discussing the risks associated with that operation. This is a model of the cervical spine, which refers to that portion of the spine in the neck area. And we have seven cervical vertebrae that we number from top to bottom, one all the way down to seven. We call them cervical vertebrae, or C for short. So C1 all the way down to C7. Between the bony vertebrae of the cervical spine, which are the natural building blocks of the spinal column, we have these discs that have a very important role in absorbing axial loading stresses, and they essentially act as shock absorbers. They also play an important role in motion and stability, your ability to twist and turn and move your neck around. Behind the discs lies the spinal canal that houses and protects the spinal cord and the nerve roots that emanate from the spinal cord. The spinal cord, of course, contains all the nerves that travel from the neck to the rest of the body. That includes nerves that provide feeling and strength and have important functions in various organs of the body. And then the nerve roots that emanate from the spinal cord go into the shoulders and arms and hands and give those areas feeling and strength. As we get older and degenerative changes set in, one of the first degenerative changes that we see that affects the spine is wear and tear that begins at the level of the discs. Those discs start to lose their shock absorbing quality. They can diminish in their natural height and then they can start bulging backwards. And that's when they can narrow the spinal canal, or worse, start displacing or compressing the spinal cord, or they can narrow the tunnels through which the nerve roots exit, and they can start causing nerve root compression. Those tunnels are called the foramina. When cervical degenerative disc disease becomes symptomatic, disc degeneration can produce disc herniations. They typically produce neck pain, that then travels from the neck through the shoulder and the arm and can actually even reach the hands. When the nerve compression is severe, then you can start to get loss of neurologic function, such as an alteration in sensation, tingling, numbness. You can also get an alteration in your strength. You can start losing some strength in the shoulder or the arm or the hand. The majority of cases of cervical disc herniations from wear and tear of the discs usually do not require surgery. They can be treated with a combination of conservative measures. We sometimes recommend physical therapy where strengthening the neck and shoulder muscles can help relieve some of the symptoms of cervical disc herniations. Sometimes traction can also help open up the spaces to relieve nerve compression. If the pain is severe, we can treat the pain with a series of medications, anti-inflammatory medications, steroid medications. If the pain is severe, we'll consider a short course of narcotics and muscle relaxants can also help. If the pain is severe, then we'll sometimes consider epidural steroid injections, which are completed by pain management specialists. That involves guiding a needle in the back of the neck with an x-ray machine and injecting steroids and occasional numbing medicine to help relieve pain. When those treatment modalities fail and the symptoms are profoundly impacting our patients' daily lives, or if patients are developing a progressive neurological deficit, that does not get better, such as tingling or numbness or weakness, then we consider surgical intervention. There are two principal surgical approaches for cervical disc herniations. The first is from the front of the neck and the other is from the back of the neck. What we're gonna talk about today is an anterior approach, which means an operation through the front of the neck. The surgery is typically performed through a small incision along one of the natural skin folds so it doesn't cause a major scar. And we find our way to the front of the spine and we physically remove the disc or the several discs that are bulging and compressing the spinal cord or the nerve roots. That's called the discectomy part. Once we're done with the removal of the disc, then there's a space where the disc used to be and we fill that space with a bone graft. That bone graft can come from your own body, it could be cadaver bone or other synthetic constructs and we typically fill the gap of that bone graft with additional materials to stimulate bone growth that may contain some cadaver components to it as well. 
You don't have to be concerned because these materials are typically biologically inert, which means that they don't incite the body to respond in a manner that would reject these synthetic grafts. Once these bone grafts are inserted into the disc spaces to fill that gap, then we usually use a titanium plate that we affix to the bony vertebra to stabilize the vertebra to allow them to fuse together. So the goals of surgery are to remove the disc that's pinching the spinal cord and or the nerve roots and alleviate pain and neurological impairment and then to stabilize the vertebra by achieving what's called a fusion with grafting and the instrumentation that we talked about. Performing a single or two level anterior cervical discectomy fusion can sometimes be done on an outpatient basis. Sometimes even more levels can be done on an outpatient basis. That usually requires patients to be relatively healthy. Patients who have a lot of medical problems will usually do those surgeries in a hospital and monitor them overnight and it's usually a hospitalization of one to two nights. The surgery is not a very painful surgery. Most patients require pain medication and a muscle relaxants for several days to several weeks at the most. Now everybody's different in the way they respond to pain, but in general it's a relatively quick recovery. You're on your feet walking every day. We do typically impose physical restrictions after surgery for about four to six weeks. That involves an avoidance of heavy lifting, typically over 10 pounds, no strenuous physical activities such as running, jumping, landing, or twisting and turning of the neck. We usually recommend either a hard or a soft collar to minimize motion for those four to six weeks. The collar will give you a sense of stability in the neck. It'll also serve as a reminder to follow those physical restrictions. You're not married to that collar. You don't have to wear it 24 seven. You can take it off to sleep. You can take it off to eat. And of course you take it off to shower and so forth. After the six week period, we get x-rays of the neck to make sure that the hardware is in good position and then we typically start physical therapy to regain all your range of motion. In general, performing one or several levels of fusion in the neck should not cause a dramatic alteration in your range of motion. We keep you stiff for the first four to six weeks, but once you begin physical therapy, barring any unforeseen circumstances, your range of motion should be much improved. The success of anterior cervical discectomy and fusion for the relief of nerve root pain is quite high. It's quite successful in relieving pain that shoots down the shoulder, to the arm or the hand, or tingling, numbness, or weakness. In general, the success rate can be up to 90%. Usually, patients experience a relief of pain first. If there is tingling or numbness or weakness, that can take weeks, sometimes months, to get better. And there are circumstances where, unfortunately, symptoms don't get better. So with a 90% success rate, for example, that also means there's a 10% chance that unfortunately the surgery is not successful. That's a very disappointing outcome for both the patient and the surgeon, but the point is that no operation is 100% guarantee. Sometimes the nerve root or the spinal cord has been compressed for so long that it's permanently damaged and we get to it too late. That's one example as to why surgery is sometimes not effective. In general, the surgery is most effective in relieving pain that travels from the neck into the shoulder and the arms it is also effective in relieving some forms of chronic neck pain, but it may not completely cure patients of chronic neck pain either. The following are the risks of this operation. Any operation carries a risk of infection, which is usually between 1 to 3%. Some patients are at slightly higher risk of infection, for example, patients who are diabetic or are immunocompromised, but in general the infection rate is quite low. We give you antibiotics during and shortly after surgery. There's no significant bleeding from this operation because the incision is quite small, so it's very rare that the surgery entails blood loss enough to require a blood transfusion. The greatest complaint by most patients is not necessarily pain after surgery, but difficulty swallowing because we move the structures in the neck around to do what we have to do, and that involves moving and retracting the esophagus, which is that muscular tube that brings food particles from the mouth to the stomach, and therefore, Many patients can get some swallowing difficulties, which are usually temporary. A single level fusion, the swallowing difficulties can be a matter of days. The more discs you have to remove and the more levels you fuse and the longer the surgery, the greater likelihood you may have some swallowing difficulties that could persist for several weeks and occasionally several months. So we usually recommend eating a soft diet for that period of time. Folks feel a lump in their throat, they have difficulty swallowing, and that eventually resolves in the majority of circumstances. A soft diet usually means foods that are 
easy to chew and swallow. Soups, smoothies, yogurts, or even pastas and rice, things that are relatively easy to digest. You, you want to be able to cut your food into small pieces and take some time masticating and chewing and swallowing. Sometimes follow that up with some water. That eventually goes away over a period of time. Occasionally this surgery can produce hoarseness in your voice. Now usually that can last for several days and that's occasionally the result of the intubation, putting a tube in your throat uh, for the general anesthesia. However, on occasion patients can develop hoarseness in their voice after surgery that can persist for longer, sometimes weeks, sometimes several months. There's even a risk of permanent voice hoarseness as a result of this operation. And that's because the nerve that comes across your neck and moves your vocal cords is sometimes in the path of surgery. The risk of permanent hoarseness after this type of surgery is less than 1%. Any operation in the neck that involves removing discs away from the spinal cord or the nerve roots entails a potential risk of spinal cord or nerve root injury. Now that can range from pain in the extremities to tingling and numbness in the extremities to weakness in the arms or legs. The severe injury of the spinal cord or the nerve roots can cause paralysis or loss of feeling, loss of bowel or bladder or sexual function. The risk of a severe spinal cord or nerve injury as a result of this type of surgery is extremely low. It's typically less than 1%. Because this surgery is a fusion surgery, that means that once we put the bone graft in position to replace the disc and we place the plate and screws to stabilize the vertebra, we then rely on your body's healing processes to grow bone through the graft to connect the bony vertebra so they can become one. That's the fusion part. And in most healthy patients who are non-smokers, the chances of a proper fusion developing in the body is greater than 90%. However, it's not 100%. And there's always a possibility that for some reason, at one level or several levels, that the fusion doesn't take and your, and your body doesn't grow bone like it should and fuse the vertebra together. Folks who are at higher risk of not healing properly are smokers, and we strongly recommend smoking cessation prior to any consideration of a cervical fusion surgery. If you don't heal properly and you develop what's called a failure of fusion, you could develop recurrent pain, recurrent arm symptoms, recurrent neurologic symptoms that could require additional surgery or that could become permanent. Once you're healed from an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion surgery, you have no significant physical restrictions within reason. There is always the possibility that other discs could wear out in your future. We call that adjacent segment degeneration. That is to say that discs adjacent to the fused segment can start undergoing degeneration after an original fusion. And it can happen in 10 to 20% of cases in a patient's lifetime. So we could fix one disc or several discs with an operation, but it's possible that other discs could wear out. And the way to minimize that is to be as healthy as you can be, not to smoke, to maintain a normal weight, and to avoid certain strenuous physical activities that could put the discs at added risk of degeneration down the road.